So Darren Moore has made his 14th signing of this window, probably his biggest signing of this window in terms of name anyway. Uh, a very famous player, the stories have followed him round, Sado Berahino. Do you remember when he burst onto the scene? It was all over, weren't it? Match of the day, Sky, they're all talking about him, he's in the newspapers, the next big thing. We see it time and again. It seems to be any young English player who's played through the England age groups, they're the next big thing. We saw it with Wilshire, you know, it happens and many of them fade. But this kid really did explode onto the scene. Uh, his debut season, he scored 15 goals in all competitions. The following season, he scored 20 goals in all competitions. Um, and he was a player who did have a tremendous scoring record with the England youth teams from under 16, right up to England under 21, where he was keeping Harry Kane out of the team. So I don't think there's any doubt that there's some tremendous ability there. At West Brom, though, things did start to unravel. And it has to be said, not from a footballing point of view, most of the issues which have surrounded his career and, and what's happened and which currently seen him playing in the backwaters of Belgium have been to do with things that happened off the pitch. First on the scene, nine goals, 20 goals, and then the first sort of incident which starts the ball rolling, he did an interview with Sky TV. Now, as a young lad, he was suddenly being thrust into the, the media spotlight, uh, suddenly got the the adulation of the crowds and a, a career that's, that's burst from seemingly nowhere. Um, he does an interview with Sky in which he's very honest, possibly naive. I don't know who's um, guiding him at the time. I don't know who his agency were, or even if he got one. But he does an interview with Sky TV in which he says he would like to move to a bigger club. It's a refreshing honesty, you could say, but at the same time, we all know how football works. And there's probably some things that you should keep behind closed doors. So probably a bit naive of him to, to do that at that stage. The club, obviously, have got to protect their best interests. So they slam a 30 million price tag on his head. They announce he's not going anywhere, um, which they have to do because they've got to protect their own reputation. You know, they've got a support base who will have been hurt because at every club when young players come through the system especially it means a little bit more to the supporters but apart from here where we like rip them to pieces but at most clubs when a player comes through all the ranks it means that bit more to the fans and so to hear one saying he wants to get out and go to a better club it's going to hurt a bit so the club have to try and handle it in the best way to keep the support on side because the supporters are stakeholders the, in terms of the monetary input that they put in and the emotional input they put in. Everybody who goes through the turnstiles at the Hawthorns is a stakeholder in some way or other. And the club have to keep those people appeased. So the interview goes out on West Brom saying, no, he's not for sale. If anyone wants him, they're going to have to pay well over the odds, which they have to do. The player don't like that and perhaps... It's his, his relative young age and a bit of naivety that he doesn't really understand how these things work and play out. They do get a bid from Spurs, which is turned down, uh, £15 million. And then he has a meeting with the chairman where he tells him he's not going to be sold, he can't leave the club. Now, the player's given his point of view on this one. He said that the chairman upset him and he made his mum cry, and I don't doubt that for the moment. And he's also said that the chairman was in the process of trying to sell the club at the time. And obviously a young English talent, which means you can basically add a zero to any potential transfer. It's a huge asset. It's an especially an asset to anyone who's looking at buying the club because you're not just buying the, the fixes and fittings, you, you are buying the players. That's the main asset of the club. And a player like that is worth a lot of money to someone who's trying to sell. So I don't doubt that there was some of that. But equally, if the chairman hadn't been trying to sell the club, the club probably would have still come out and put a massive price tag on his head because they have to appease the fan base. And I think that's something a young lad probably not aware of. So a £15 million bid from Spurs is turned down. The player then goes on Twitter after this meeting, says he, he was never going to play for the club again while this chairman's in charge. Um, 
and it all turns a little bit ugly behind the scenes. Tony Poulis, the manager, who a lot of Wednesday fans probably are not bothered about, and probably the wider football world, a lot of people aren't bothered about his uh, tactics and style, but he keeps faith with the play, keeps him in the team, and he talks positively in the press. Uh, him and Solomon Rondon are going to be the, the front pair that take him on to the next level, and, and that sort of thing. They then get other bids, because once it's started, once the ball's rolling, other bids come in, so Stoke bid 17 million, which is turned down. Crystal Palace bid 17 million. They want to partner him up front with Christian Benteke. So th these bids start coming in then, and I think it does distract the player. He goes through a bit of a lean run, he puts a bit of weight on, and he's, he's told that he, he was depressed about the situation. Uh, although probably not fully understand the situation. As I said, a young lad, it's a, it's a business environment, and he's probably just someone who wants to play football. Eventually, he does get his move uh, because things are starting to come to light. He scores a couple of goals in a game. I can't remember who it against. I can remember the incident quite clearly because match of the day made a big thing of it. He scored a couple of goals and he didn't celebrate. And it was the old thing of, oh, look, he's been held against his will. And Pulis comes out after the game. The, the interviewer says to him, well, he doesn't look very happy. Does he still want to wait? Is he being held to ransom? And Pulis says, no, he's happy. You know, he's in there, he loves scoring goals, he's celebrating in dressing room. And he has to say that. Pulis has to say that because he's got to make it look to the fans like there's no trouble at the club. That's part of his job. Um, but he does eventually get a move to Stoke a year later. After missing eight games, which was kept relatively quiet and localised. Mark Hughes signs him for Stoke. And somewhat bizarrely, Hughes admits in a press interview he thinks they got him for a lower price than the original bid that they made because he's just served a suspension for taking nitrous oxide, which a bizarre thing for a manager to admit about his new signing. So he's barely in the door at Stoke, Berahino, when he's having to do a press statement saying, I was young, I was naive, blah, 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 even though it's only like a year ago. So not the best start to his Stoke career. I come back to Poulis at this stage because at West Brom, there was a stability in the Poulis. Whatever we think about his, his style of football, his training methods, whatever. And I think some of our players have said they didn't like the training. There was a stability at West Brom. There was a stability at Stoke for 13 years that Poulis was there. Okay, he had a year out. He, he went to Plymouth when the... Stoke Icelandic man, uh, management team above him, the, the owners, the Icelandic, they said they weren't signing enough foreign players. So, pull this out of year out. But, overall, 13 years at Stoke, he made them into a stable club. They promoted from the Championship to the Premier League. They stabilise in the Premier League. They get to the FA Cup final. And he keeps them there or thereabouts without spending a huge amount of money. Now, whatever you say about pull this, he does bring that stability to the club. Everybody knows what they're doing. He gives them an identity and everybody knows the job. It might be repetitive, it might be boring. Everyone knows what they're doing. And young lads need structure in their lives and they need to know what they're doing. They need a routine. But he know, after his trouble with the chairman, the bids from Spurs, and when he says he wants to go there, the Palace bid, he eventually goes to Stoke, and I don't know if he moves just for the sake of it at this stage, because the Stoke team that he joins is not the stable club that Tony Poulis had left. Mark Hughes has come in, he's tried to put his own stamp on things, he's trying to move away from the, the long ball reputation, he's changing the, the training methods and the things that they do, and they're having a struggle in that transition period. Obviously some of the old players have got used to the way they do things, they don't like it, he's bringing players in and out, they're trying to Change of style. Benahino comes in, he has a bad run. He doesn't score for 31 games. They look like they, they're going to be relegated. Hughes goals. Paul Lambert comes in. Now, Lambert, since, has, has been quite brutal in the press about what he found there. He thought the standards were really slack. And if you look back now, even at the um, 
match of the day interviews after their defeats, of which they had many, you can see there's a barely concealed contempt for a lot of those players. This is sort of backed up by interviews other players have done about that time at the club. Glenn Johnson uh, famously asked about Berahino specifically said, if I was a manager, I wouldn't take him if you paid me, which quite harsh from next teammate, although Johnson has reiterated since that time, he did mention other players would also not pull in the weight, but he was specifically asked about Benahino and that's what he gave the answer. But he has said since that there was loads of players doing that. Equally, Peter Crouch was asked about that interview and he said, I don't disagree with Glenn, but there were many other players not pulling the weight. So it's a Stoke team in a, a state of flux. Lambert comes in, can't rest with them, they get relegated. Benahino still not scoring goals. And for a young lad who needs a routine, He's already had two managers at this club playing different styles of play, different formation. He's been moved around and he's not scoring goals. Gary, Gary Rowett comes in. Well, at that stage, he's on an upward curve. He's the young manager that people are talking about. You go on the, the bookies' sites every time there's a job, his name's there in the top five. He's on that path. He comes in, he talks very positively about that. He knows he, he, he sees him as the future of the club. But well, he still goes, I think it's 918 games without a goal, which is a long stretch. And as much as Rowett likes him, he's only there himself 29 games and he moves on. The next man in the door is this Graham Jones, who he's the new latest in coach, who's got the right methods, the modern way of playing, etc, etc. He's only there 38 games. Stoke, at that time, are not a stable environment for a young lad who clearly, with some of the things that happened off the pitch, which he'll come to, He's somebody who needs a bit of guidance and structure and routine in his life. It's under Graham Jones at the end that Stoke eventually get rid of Berahino. Now they've been relegated from the Premier League to the Championship. They've got a lot of players who've been signed for big money and are on big wages. They're looking to offload some of them when it looks like they're not going to get straight back up. So they don't get that first season bounce back up and so they then start looking at having to trim the wage bill. It's at this stage that Benahino does something which sort of falls into the, the laps of the money men who probably couldn't believe the luck. He gets done for drink driving and given a 30 month ban. They look into the ramifications of this, is there any way around it, and they manage to terminate his contract, which to them was probably a, you know, thank you, Lord. So he gets released, and that is why he's currently in the backwaters of Belgium at 28 years old and having a largely unfulfilled career despite vast early potential. And it was vast early potential. Gareth Southgate described him as a player who reminded him of Jermaine Defoe and that he thought he could go on to have a similar sort of career. He talks about his intelligent movement around the box, his ability to use both feet, his pace, his ability to beat a man with a trick and a complete range of different finishes. High praise indeed. So there's a talent there that's been largely wasted and the drink driving thing gave Stoke really an excuse to get a high earner off the books. Now he's talked himself in a recent interview about that last drink driving charge which brought the 30 month ban. And the situation as a whole, and he, he says that the press left out much of the story and the part of the story was that he'd been for a night out in London had a few drinks, he'd come out and he got robbed at knife point. Why is in London eating out and drinking the night before the reserve game? I don't know, but he gets mugged at knife point, which must be a terrifying experience. It must be a terrifying experience. So they rob him, I think they give him a crack, he's, he's a bit torn up. Um, they steal his stuff and coming away from the incident, he jumps in his car and tries to escape, which I think is understandable from anybody. I'm pretty sure I'd probably do the same. Not very good thieves, all these muggers. Uh, you rob a millionaire footballer, you don't take his car keys. Odd. But anyway, he jumps in the car, he drives around the corner, the police arrest him. Drink driving. Now, he says the press left a bit about the mugging out of the story, which I don't doubt is true. Um, and we can look at it and say, well, that's the entrenched racism of the, the gutter British press. 
And they have got form for it. Make no doubt about that. You look at the, the treatment that Raheem Sterling's had. Um, however, it's not just the right wing gutter British press. It's all there to see on the various court reports. You can go into the Crown thing. You can even find out what court he was in. So this isn't just made up stories by the press. This is factual. And he had got form for it. It was first done for him driving in 2012. This is before he's even burst into the West Brom first team. Done again in 2014 for being drunk at the wheel. And 2014 is also the year of the nitrous oxide at the end of his West Brom tenure when he underwent an eight game ban, which was largely kept localised, in which why I'm amazed Mark Hughes admitted that. Although I don't think Hughes was perhaps trying to explain to this journalist why he thought he got the player for less money than they'd originally bid. Um, because people do like to show off and they think they've uh, saved some money, don't they? People do it at work. How much? Guess how much? So it's been done in 2012, 2014 for drink and the nitrous oxide. 2016 gets done for MDMA. This is, whilst he's at Stokes, and then he has to do a, a press thing and, and say, my drink was spiked. So his time at Stoke has not been a good one at all. Then in 2019, while well, still at Stoke, the third uh, and final drink driving with the 30-month ban. Now, the press will go with the bad story. We know that they get people in their sights. But this is fuel for it. Four times. The most recent one I said is only three years ago. It's not been done since that, so perhaps he has turned over a new leaf. Perhaps he's, he's got over that naivety. The thing is, though, that is a large window from the first one at 2012 to the second one, 2019. That's a seven-year window of consistent um, mistakes or, or bad behaviour, whatever you want to call it. Now he wants to come back to the country, come back to England and try and make a second go of it. Lots of players do this, supposed bad boys and probably one or two genuine bad boys. I don't think this kid is a bad boy from what I've seen, but he's certainly someone who's made a lot of mistakes. A lot of these players beg for a second chance and sometimes a third chance. And the game is littered with just as many of those as the people who actually make mistakes. So Niall Ranger, Gary Medine, Tony Adams even, Stan Collymore, Leon Nine, Lee Hughes. As many make these mistakes as as many ask for a second chance. Very rarely, sadly, do they take them though. Can better he not take his? Well, talk's cheap. It's easy to say I've turned over a new leaf. I was young, I was naive. I want redemption. We, we hear it time and again. The one positive thing I would say about this though, is that he's prepared to come to Wednesday in the third division. And he's apparently taken a pay cut to come. That gives me an early sense of positivity because, like I said, talk's cheap, but to actually do those things is physically put it into reality, and I think that's a very good first step. Now, from Wednesday's point of view, is this a gamble? Well, it's always a gamble. Every player's a gamble. Every single player. You, you can sign the best player in the world. They might not fit at your club at your time. So every player's a gamble. Is it one that Wednesday can potentially lose from? No, I don't think it is. Because he's taking a wage cut, he's coming in for a relatively small transition fee. I don't think we can really lose. If it doesn't work out, the player loses out more than Wednesday will lose out. And if it does work out, great news for the player who, who can get his career back on track. And possibly sensational for Wednesday, who will be getting a player on their books, who has got tremendous talent, should probably be playing at a much higher level. I don't think you can have a better opportunity. I genuinely don't. I don't think there's a club at this particular time, anywhere in the world, that's better suited for him to try and get his career back on track. There are several reasons for that. Firstly, when is he a big enough club? Now, I don't say that to show off about Massive or anything like that. But a lot of talented players, if they move down or they go to a smaller club, they can start sinking. They can, their standards start getting dragged down with the players around them. You often see this with players in their later years who love, who love the game, 
we'll move to club we saw with Ian Rush, we've seen it with Peter Beardsley, but went back to Carlisle. They don't lift the players around them, the players around them, who might be doing their absolute best, haven't got that ability, and you end up lowering them down to their standard. Wednesday are a big club, we've made some really positive signings this season. Younger players whose careers are on a, an upward trajectory, working for a positive manager, a forward thinking manager who's trying to attack. So that's the first positive for the player and for Wednesday. I think it's the, the right club at the right time and, and the right sized club. The other thing is we are in third division, which might sound like a negative, but it's actually good, I think, because he's out of the spotlight. He can come here, he can work hard, he can work with Darren Moore, but if he goes five games or ten games without scoring a goal, it's not going to be all over the back of a telegraph that he's back to his old ways like a stoke when he didn't score for 900 days. It's not going to be over the back of the Sun or the Guardian or whatever. It's a big club, but the third division is just slightly out of the limelight, and I think that will suit him uh, and give him an environment to flourish in without too much pressure. The only pressure applied will be the pressure that Wednesday fans might put on him because of his name. The third factor is the manager. I don't think there can be a better manager to manage this player at this time in his life. He knows him already, they've already got a relationship, which is a, a good thing. But also, Darren Moore is a young black manager, one of the very few in the British game. And I don't want to make this into a race issue because it's not a race issue. I think it's a human issue. I think it's a cultural issue. There's a lot of young black players in this country who have a very tough time of it, but very few of them get the opportunity to work with someone and for someone who knows exactly where they're coming from, has seen the things that they've seen and, and go through the things they experience. So whilst it's not a race issue, I do think it is almost a cultural issue and a, and a life experience issue. I think Darren Moore will have a lot to offer because he's made those same footsteps. In fact, it's a very similar parallel, both from Birmingham, Although originally, obviously better he knows from Burundi, but from 10 years old, he's grown up in the Midlands, in Birmingham, in that environment. He knows the culture of the Midlands, so does Dad and Moore. They both come up through the West Brom system. Again, that's something else that they've got in common. And he's treading in the footsteps that Dad and Moore has already taken. And I don't think that really can be highlighted enough as how, how big an impact that can have. In terms of an, a mentor who knows exactly where you're coming from, knows exactly the sort of things that you're going through and have been exposed to. Put all those things together, and this is why I genuinely think that at this time in Berahino's life, there is no better place in football, and I mean any club in the world, at this particular moment, with this particular set of circumstances, where he could rebuild his career. I genuinely think this is the best hope he has got anywhere in the world. Big club, slightly out of the spotlight, a manager who knows him, who's been through similar himself, who's played positive attacking football. This group, with this dressing room, a positive dressing room, a lot of strong characters in there as well, with a level of expectation. Hutchinson, Bannon, Dunkley, there's a lot of leaders in there. A great manager, I think it represents a unique opportunity for the player to get his career back on track. They can't be a better environment. And genuinely, I want to say this, if Benahino can't get his career back on track here at Sheffield Wednesday in 2021, I don't think he'll be able to get his career back on track anywhere. Will he take it? That's largely down to him. But he can't have a better environment to try and do it in. I genuinely believe that anywhere in the world. So I'll just finish by going back to something that Tony Pooley said right at the beginning of his career. He said about Berahino, here's a lad with all the ability in the world, all the class to go to the very, very top. If, if he listens to the right guidance and takes it on board. That's down to the player. But he can't have a better set of circumstances to try and do it in. I hope he's a, a huge success for him. I think it'll fulfil him as a person as well as a player. And if he does it, 
it could be a sensational bit of business for Wednesday. I've got faith that if anyone can do that and get it out of him, it is this manager. 